with that said, we have two speakers today. We have Ben Haynes and we have uh, Jay Coons. So it's going to be a great talk tonight. So uh, enjoy. Good morning. How's everyone doing? You guys are actually looking all right today. I didn't know how many. I thought it was just going to be Ben and I here this morning, but it's great to see you. So my name is Jake Coons. I'm uh, the Chief Innovation Officer at Flashpoint. Uh, this is joined by Ben Haynes, data scientist. We're from a company called Flashpoint. If you don't know about us, you can come check us out in the expo. Um, but today, we're here to do a talk. It's called Too Many Vulnerability Prioritization Standards. Use this one instead. And hopefully, you find the irony in that, uh, that title there. Um, I, like, I like to sort of start with why the heck should you listen? There's a lot of cybersecurity experts out there. Um, but what Ben and I uh, have been doing for a while is we've actually been working on the vulnerability intelligence itself. So there's a lot of companies out there that are doing, I'll say, analysis of data and putting out sort of uh, work, which is great work. Uh, very few of them are actually collecting the vulnerability data and understand the data itself. And that's where Ben and I have been doing this for quite some time. So we're excited to be here to share some information with you. All right. Um, while we were working on this, we had quite a few office space moments. Um, I see one laughter. All right, show of hands. I know it's early in the morning. Who has seen the movie Office Space? All right, there's only a couple of you. Either you're, you're on your phone or you're not paying attention or you have homework maybe if you haven't seen it. So if you haven't seen it, you need to go watch it. If you haven't watched it in a while, rewatch it. It's pretty funny even though maybe we need like a hybrid work from home office space new movie. So anyways, for the agenda today, we want to do a little level setting. We want to then talk about sort of the evolution of vulnerability prioritization. And then in sort of in a perfect nirvana world, what would uh, a priority sort of method be, right? From there, we're going to go into sort of a survey of the, the methods. And then how would you evaluate these methods? Um, and then finally, we'll close out with some different ways to think, some innovative ideas, and then try to send you out of here with some real world practitioner guidance, okay? And I will say, uh, unlike Milton here, who didn't get a cake because there wasn't enough cake to go around, we've got a lot of content today. So we're going to power through as fast as we can. Um, if there's questions, let's hold them to the end, or we can get Ben uh, and I out in the hallway, okay? All right, so best part of the whole movie, what is it you say that you do here? So I know it's early, but bear with me here. So show of hands. Who's in the threat intelligence space that's in the room today? Who thinks they do threat intelligence? All right, I thought it was going to be a lot more. Um, what about the vulnerability management, vulnerability intelligence space? All right, this is great. Vulnerability people unite here at a more mostly threat intelligence conference. I love it. What about vendor risk? Who, who thinks that there's vendor risk in their world? A couple of you. Just engineering. Yeah, this is an engineering track. And some engineers in the room. All right, what about any pointy hair management folks? There we go, a couple of you, I love it. All right, that helps a ton. All right, um, the next thing I wanna do is, let's just, that level set on from a priority uh, sort of method awareness and usage. Let's, let's do this. How many of you know what CVSS is? All right, great, right? The Common Vulnerability Scoring System. Same show of hands that said that they, they know it. Do you actually use it? Do you use it in your organization? All right, a fair amount. What about EPSS? Who knows EPSS? All right, less, as expected. Exploit prediction scoring system. For those that raise their hand, do you actually use it? Show of hands. One of you, two of you, three of you. Okay. What about SSVC? Have you heard of this one? All right, I got one guy that love it. All right, this stands for Stakeholder Specific Vulnerability Categorization, and I'm guessing you don't use it. Exactly, all right. All right, uh, what about the CISA KEV? Do we know what the KEV is? A lot of you should know what the KEV is. All right, maybe, maybe a little less than half. All right, this is the Known Exploited Vulnerabilities Catalog. Do we use it? If you're at a government organization, you probably use it, right? All right, and then what about, do you have any other vendor specific or your own custom internal sort of scoring that you're rating the use? All right, great. All right, that helps a ton. Okay, so let's move along into the evolution of vulnerability uh, prioritization here. Okay, so 
I do want to say that there is just absolute vulnerability overload, right? All software has vulnerabilities. We, we know this. Uh, it feels like it shouldn't, but it just is an inevitability. It's what it is, right? We're at over 330,000 vulnerabilities all time, over 20,000 vulnerabilities uh, this year alone, and it's just growing. Uh, the scary thing is depending who you're looking at, uh, if you're looking just at CVE and NVD, it's very, very incomplete. I sort of say CVE is like this tall to ride the ride, but they're missing about 100,000 vulnerabilities. So make sure, depending on the software that you're using, you're getting all the intelligence that's out there, okay? Um, in the old school way, and I do see a couple grayer beards and gray hairs in the room, um, vulnerability prioritization was really just making sure your boss didn't give you grief, right? I mean, it really was, it was, you don't want your boss giving you grief or you want to stay away from a, a problem, right? Whether it was a real issue at your organization or there was a vulnerability or something that came out and was getting media attention. So that was sort of like, you know, you're going about doing your work and then, ooh, I need to work on something. That was how we prioritize, right? And then just when you thought like you got your boss off your, your, your tail here or whatever you want to say, comes back around again and says, hey, it would be great if you could get those TPS reports. I mean, Voln scan pen test remediation reports done, right? So this sort of was uh, the way that we did it. I mean, that was it. And let's be honest, uh, no one liked us in security. I don't even think we liked working in security. It wasn't great. Uh, what we were doing just wasn't working. We weren't really able to report stats very well. Um, and frankly, we just needed to be better about it. Right, So this is where we start getting into sort of what I believe is more of a sort of a timeline evolution of, of prioritization, okay? So um, classification was really the first way that we started uh, prioritizing. It was really about, hey, can this vulnerability be triggered remotely? And is there an exploit available? Is it public, right? And so in uh, 98, right, this is when PacketStorm was out. People remember PacketStorm, right? Listing of exploits, we started to see um, 2003 was Metasploit, 2004 we started to see Millworm, right? So this was, if there's Vulns out and then there's an exploit for it, a classification type, we would prioritize it, okay? From there in February 2005, this is the first version of CVSS, okay? Um, ben in a little bit will go into how all this stuff works a lot more, but CVSS was really about just trying to, to create a formula, a standard that would give a severity score to the vulnerability, right? Not risk, but how severe is, is the vulnerability, okay? That's 2005. Uh, V2 comes out in 2007, and this is really when things started to, I'll say, stick. This is when vendors were starting to score, people were start using it. The first version, it came out, there was a lot of talks, sounded neat, didn't get really uh, you know, much, much adoption. Here, uh, V2, that it, that it does, and this is where we started to see traction. Okay, right after that, then we started to see some vendors, um, again, really focus on exploitability, right? So we saw uh, Microsoft came out with the exploitable index in 2008, and then Adobe in and, and 2012 had their uh, priority rating as well. And it was really, again, will these vulnerabilities have a chance to be exploited so that you can help prioritize uh, remediation? Now, uh, not as many threat intelligence people in the room, so I won't get as many dirty looks as I thought I would get, but that 2013-2015 timeframe, some could argue, but this is really when we started to see, you know, instead of sort of CTI feeds that were basically just, you know, dumping addre IP addresses and domains and hashes and you know, all those sorts of things, this is when we started to see intelligence become a little more actionable, right? So you start getting that malicious mentions uh, monitoring. Are threat actors talking about certain vulns? Are they talking about exploits? These kinds of things. We started to be able to add this into, you know, how are we going to prioritize things? All right. Now, eight years after CVSS v2 was released, we now have CVSS version three, okay? Uh, v2 was good, but as technology was starting to change and we were starting to see, you know, containers and, and different sort of uh, chaining of vulns, V2 was showing its age and it wasn't, there were problems, okay? And so uh, quite some time since an update, but then we get V3, 
Um, you would think newer is better, but in some ways it broke some fundamental things that vulnerability people cared about. Some other ways it made almost everything feel like it was high priority. Um, but this, this is really uh, a, a big change. And shortly after, we then got 3.1 which when most people say, hey, V3, they're really talking about 3.1. These were some tweaks that made it a little bit more usable and what we're, what we're seeing most people use today. All right, um, now in the summer of 2019, this is when we get EPSS, okay? Uh, this is the exploit prediction scoring system. Uh, the theory being, look, if there's a vulnerability and it can't be triggered, there's no usable exploit, then like, do we care about the vulnerability? So the theory is sound. The first version of it was trying to determine not just if there would be an exploit, but would there be an exploit used in the wild over the next 365 days, okay? Paper comes out um, and neat thoughts, didn't, hasn't, didn't really work as great as expected, but very sort of conceptually forward thinking. Um, December 2019 of that year, this is when we get SSVC, right? We talked about that. It's the stakeholder specific vulnerability categorization. SEI was working on this in 2019. It's now been announced uh, November 2022 as part of uh, CISA. Um, but this is really uh, a, another play on hey, CVSS isn't working. This is a different sort of path to go about prioritizing vols. All right. Um, CISA Kev, we know this one. We talked about it in November 2021. Um, this is about vulnerabilities that we know that are being exploited. Um, so if you know that this is happening, then these are the ones where obviously we should fix no matter what. EPSS version 2 comes out in February 2022. Um, and this is where we start to see significant changes in the model. Version 3 comes out March of this year. This is when they're starting to take a lot more feeds in. We're seeing some really good results right now with EPSS uh, version 3. We'll talk some more about that. And then here we have uh, version four of CVSS that has come out in June. Uh, a lot of it is to address a lot of the concerns that people were bashing CVSS. It's a little broader in scope and focus. Um, it's just out, so there's still not a lot of people scoring and using it, but we're gonna see where this goes. So uh, pretty clear, huh? Right? You haven't left yet, so you know maybe you're not losing it, maybe you're not getting out of here. But, okay, great, showed you all that. It brings you up to speed of where we are. There's a lot going on. Now, in a perfect Nirvana world, what would a good prioritization method look like? What should it do? And we can joke, but hopefully this guy doesn't come knocking on my door. Hopefully Krebs doesn't you know, email us and go, hey, I'd like to talk to you about something. Um, and, you know, funny, right? But at the same time, you really just want to assure nothing negative or minimize impact to your company. You want to stay out of the headlines. You don't want to be on the top list of data breaches. You don't want your boss to come bother you. I mean, that, that would be ideal for prioritizing vulnerabilities, right? That's kind of what we're trying to do. And so it's pretty simple. We should do this. We should figure this out by now, right? You know what the problems are, right? Maybe not. All right, so if we take it a little bit differently and we say, great, okay, let's, instead of sort of just don't get hacked, that would be great, uh, how can we evaluate things? And we kind of look at it in two ways. The first is sort of objective, right? Um, how well does it stop me from getting hacked? How easily can someone like me get the data or whatever I need to do? And then how easily can I operationalize this at my organization? Okay, those are, you could come up with a bunch, but those three are pretty reasonable. And then the subjective side of it is, well, how transparent is the methodology? How intuitive is the recommendation? And then how flexible is it in case I need to, um, you know, change it a little bit for my organization? All right, so with that, I'm gonna have Ben now take you through uh, an adventure uh, of what those current methods are, how they really work, and, and give you some more details. Awesome. Thanks, Jake. So Jake really went in, uh, through the, the history of this all and, and the evolution of that uh, and his experience with it. So I'm gonna go more in depth on how it works and we're gonna talk about some pros and cons of each of those individual methods. So the first one and really the most fundamental thing is classification. Uh, if you really care about a thing and a vulnerability is that thing, you should probably fix that vulnerability first. Uh, for a lot of people that thing is exploitability or is it in the news or uh, is it being talked about in illicit communities or something like that. 
Um, and this is pretty straightforward to do, right? You just make a list of the things you care about. Uh, you research all of those things for all of your vulnerabilities, and then you make an informed decision based on those results. Uh, this is an example that I think about all the time. Uh, so you've got all the vulnerabilities where you know that there's publicly available exploit information. You've got all the vulnerabilities that are remotely or easily exploitable, and then you have all the vulnerabilities where solution information is also available. And in the center are the vulnerabilities that are all three, right? Those are the things you can fix and should. And what this does is it looks at hundreds of thousands of vulnerabilities and scrunches it down to maybe tens of thousands. That's that gray center right there. Uh, and of course, you can throw in more things in the mix. You know, does it affect Adobe and does it do this and that, uh, depending on what you care about. But this is, I think, a pretty good uh, heuristic. Now, there are issues with this, right? First of all, you got to know what you care about. Most people can probably think of their top three or their top five things that matter to them, but a top 20 or a top 50 is a little harder. Um, the second thing is that not everyone really knows how important each of these things is. So we would probably all agree that exploitability is super important, but how much more important is it than, you know, the fact that it would affect the confidentiality of my data? Like, that's a little bit hard to quantify. It's also a lot of work. So even if you knew exactly what you wanted, you still got to go and, like, do all the work. Um, and, you know, that's a little much. So what if we offloaded a lot of that onto someone else, right? Put the power in someone else's hands, and that's really where CVSS comes in, right? This is a case where like a special interest group would create a rubric. They decide what's important. They decide how important everything is. Um, they make a little calculator and then someone like NVD would come in and fill in the score for all of those vulnerabilities. And then you can just go look up those scores or you get them from your scanner or you get them from some kind of feed. You sort highest to lowest and you say, ah, 10.0, I'm going to fix that one first. And, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Now, again, there are issues with that, right? You've, uh, given the power over to someone else to make the decision about how this works, and you know, as we all know, with great power comes great responsibility, and what that means is if they change things in that rubric, it's gonna affect you downstream, right? So one of the downstream effects that we see all the time is the fact that in CVSS v2, certain vulnerabilities were treated as network vulns. And then in v3, those same vulnerabilities, nothing about the world has changed, are now treated as local vulns. And that has downstream effects on the score, and therefore it has downstream effects on what you're prioritizing. You haven't done anything different, or, or you know, no one's changing their minds on anything other than the people creating the rubric. Uh, to zoom out a little bit on what this really means, I want to show you a plot. So what this plot is, is all the CVSS v2 and v3 scores for every vulnerability. And if we found that scores didn't change between v2 and v3, they'd fall along this line. Uh, but of course, there are some vulnerabilities where the score went down between v2 to v3. These are things that you would have prioritized in v2, but wouldn't in v3. And these are all the vulnerabilities that you are now going to prioritize in v3 that you wouldn't have in, in v2. And that's just a lot more work. It's a lot more noise to sift through, right? This is a, a problem with v3 is that it uprates vulnerabilities. To put it more simply, this is just a bar chart of those two things, right? On the left is the vulnerabilities in CVSS v2 that are high and critical, or about 50,000. And then on the right are the vulnerabilities that are high and critical in v3, right? So if you say, I'm going to go fix the high and criticals, you have maybe 40%, 50% more work to do. Uh, the words we're using to describe these vulnerabilities haven't changed. We call them high and critical, but how they're defined has been changed. Uh, and that's not very intuitive and it's a little frustrating to deal with. So, okay. What if we took some of the power back, but we, we like the, the, um, you know, the, the authoritative, um, take on it, you know, as to what matters and all of that. So that's where SSVC sort of literally puts CVSS on its head and gives you a decision tree. It asks you questions and it gives you a very prescriptive uh, recommendation that you should take based on the answers to your questions. So you identify what vulnerability you want to prioritize. You answer those four questions, which are what kind of exploits available? Is it automatable? What's the technical impact? And how does it affect me personally? And then it recommends something. It'll say, oh, you should act on that right now. Or it'll say, well, keep an eye on it and, and you know, act later maybe. This is great. There are some problems, right? You gotta answer those four questions for every single vulnerability and that's just not feasible for a, a lot of people, right? Another thing is when we look at what the answers to these questions really mean to the recommendation that it gives, these two are really the ones that matter. Is there an exploit and how badly is it gonna hurt me? And uh, those are great questions. Those are probably the right questions, but those are a little bit obvious, right? It, it's like not advancing our thinking very much. We wanna think a bit differently here. 
So, all right. Again, we like the authority of that, and we like the explicit recommendation. So we have CISA's cat, right? This is a list of all the vulns that CISA knows are being exploited, and it even has a due date that you should fix them by, right? It's very cut and dry, very straightforward. This is great. We have noticed some things. Even though it's a really good resource, um, there are some strange inconsistencies. So if you picture this yellow circle as all the vulns that are being exploited in the world, right? The kev is just a little subset. It's that red dot. And frankly, that's not proportional, right? It should probably be even smaller. Um, you'll also notice another thing, which is that the red dot's hanging off the edge of the yellow a little bit. And that's because there's actually vulns on the kev that aren't real vulnerabilities, couldn't possibly be exploited, and shouldn't be on the kev, right? Um, and, you know, that's a problem for two reasons I think are maybe obvious. One being that it's telling you, it's urging you to fix a vulnerability you cannot do anything about because it doesn't exist. That's not good. And another thing is, um, I think one of the main draws of the KEV is that it's, a, and it's an authoritative resource of information. And if there's bad information on it, it undercuts the credibility of the KEV as an authoritative resource, right? So we want to um, be wary of things like this. Now, a different type of authority, the authority that's near and dear to my heart is the authority of like data, you know, what's happened in the past and, and what can we glean for that about the future. And that's where EPSS comes in. Uh, EPSS attempts to predict if a vulnerability, a new vulnerability, will be exploited in the future. And that's great because if you can um, predict that it'll be exploited, then you can remediate that before it's exploited and get ahead of it. And we think this is really well motivated. What you see in the chart on the right is the time between a vuln coming out and being exploited. And you'll see it's really shrinking in the past couple years. So now more than ever, it's really important to try to get ahead of that exploitation. And how this works is similar to CVSS, but there's a really important difference. So you find the interesting factors on a vuln, right? You weigh them according to their predictive ability. So for example, if a vuln mentions Microsoft, it's more likely to be exploited. If it mentions Apple, it's less likely to be exploited. And then you act on the vulnerabilities that are predicted will be exploited. Why I say this is different is that uh, even though there's some human intervention involved, this is a mathematical procedure. This is regression. This is something that industries have done for decades. Um, there, there's a mathematical way in which we decide these weights and, and do model selection to decide which factors go into it. So that was the first generation of EPSS. And the same concept, same end output, um, but a, a more like juiced up approach was the EPSS v2 and v3 iterations. So this is throwing more data into it and then using a uh, machine learning thing called gradient boosting that I, I don't have time to talk about right now. Um, if you're interested in gradient boosting, I'd be happy to talk about it at some other point. So, okay, uh, we, we you know talked about a lot and, and given a lot of information, but uh, we're, we're still not there yet. We're, we're still not getting any work done. Like what is a good model and what works, right? And this is where I wanna talk briefly about how you should evaluate a method, right? Jake mentioned earlier the qualities that we're looking for in a prioritization method. I talked about how they work, but I still haven't really talked about how well they work. Right, so I'm gonna do that. This is a, a table, it's a bit of a report card on how uh, the different methods perform according to the qualities that we've called out. Um, just to give a few examples, you know, CVSS is very transparent. You can go read the rubric, it's available to anyone in this room. Um, but it's not freely available as a score, right? NVD takes a while to score. I think in the last year they just straight up stopped scoring CVSS v2, um, so that's not great. On the flip side, EPSS uh, v3 is, you know, on the first.org website. You can go get the probability that any vuln, any CVE, I should say, is being exploited. But if you were to ask someone how the model works, they really couldn't tell you, and that's just because of the nature of machine learning and all that. One glaring omission here is that I haven't filled anything for the effective column, and that's because we still have uh, not really answered the question of what it means for a prioritization method to be effective. So I'm gonna do that now. Uh, this is based on a take from the 2023 EPSS paper that I think is a, a pretty good angle for evaluating this. And they state two stats that really stuck out to me. One was that organizations fix about 15% of vulns and that only about 5% of vulns are actually uh, actively exploited or, or attempted to be exploited. So if you picture that gray circle as being all the vulns, that red circle is your target, right? And what your goal is in prioritization is to kind of shoot a missile at that target, and that blue circle is your blast radius, that's like your area of effect, right? So you can afford to be a little sloppy because the blue circle's larger than the red circle, 
but you want to find a, a methodical way to kind of guide that missile, right? Whether it be heat seeking or otherwise to that, that red target. Now, one approach, which is totally infeasible, is to just nuke the whole thing and fix everything, right? Obviously no one can do that, but it would certainly make sure that you fix all of that red stuff, right? The other end of the spectrum is to just fix nothing. That would be perfectly efficient if you're worried about doing too much work. Um, of course, that wouldn't really get the job done or answer the question. And then, you know, like the baby bear in Goldilocks, the truth lies somewhere in the middle, right? You gotta fix just the right things. And so I'm gonna show you some of the conclusions from the EPSS paper on some of the methods we've looked at so far. This is just evaluating how effective EPSS feels um, that target is hit. And of course, they get to define what that target is. I'm just gonna point out a couple things. One being that from EPSS V1 to two to three, that blue circle really starts to eclipse the red, meaning that they are uh, covering more of the issues that they find important. So they're certainly um, hitting their goals. Another thing that I think is interesting to point out is that you know, EPSS V1 was very forward thinking at the time and very technical a couple years ago, but it's really as effective as using that age old classification method up top. As long as you pick the right classification, and if anyone guessed what that answer was, it was RC evils. So if you fix all the RC evils, you are about as effective as EPSS V1, right? And you could have been doing that a decade ago. The last thing I'll point out is the Kev catalog. Our blue circle is very small because the Kev list, as cool as it is, is short. So you don't have a lot of meat on the bone to really chew on issues there. So if it were bigger, that would be a lot better. Uh, you'll also notice that the way that you know, those two circles are in conjunction, kind of remind you of that chart we saw earlier with the yellow circle and the red circle. Anywho, so I filled in the uh, effectiveness that we've estimated here, right? Um, EPSS appears effective by that measure, some other things maybe less so. There's still SSVC undecided, right? And, and this is just because uh, I would have to answer all those questions for every vulnerability to determine, you know, if, uh, SSVC was effective, and I'm just not going to do that. It's not possible. And again, here we are, right? We're, we're edging asymptotically closer to an answer, but we still don't have one. Like, we have a report card of how they do on each individual thing, but like, we're not getting an answer out of this yet. So that's why I want to share with you some um, innovative methods that we've been working on. Um, I'm going to share with you three uh, specifically that maybe bridge some of the gaps we've been seeing here. Uh, and uh, that, that I think are really, really um, interesting. So the first one here is the concept of social risk, right? What are people talking about? If uh, the social media conversation reaches a bad actor or something like that, then we think a bad outcome might, might occur. And how this usually works is a vulnerability gets disclosed, a solution gets posted, you know, your boss sees it on LinkedIn, uh, so they nag you about it and you fix it, and then exploitation happens, and luckily you're protected. But this is still not optimal, because you had to react to something happening once it was not too late, but um, you know, later than you'd want. So if we can flag something as being a high social risk, you can fix it before um, you know, it reaches that crest, that, that crescendo, that peak. And uh, this is how our implementation kind of approaches it. This is a vulnerability from 2022, and when it was disclosed, there was a big pop in activity we saw. And then, of course, like, uh, anything on social media, our attention waned and moved on to something else. And uh, it, it died out until it was mentioned in Forbes, and there was some activity again. And then that died out until there were some reports of it being used in ransomware, then that died out until there were some reports about its mitigation later. And what I wanna point out is, point out here is that we've um, done something that I think is really cool. We've uh, implemented what I call an attention span parameter. So this is like saying that if a normal vulnerability gets its 15 minutes of fame, uh, on social media, and something's dominating the conversation for longer than those 15 minutes, then we think that that's something that's really important. Even if it hasn't hit its peak yet, we'd say, oh, okay, this thing is kind of overstated, it's welcome, we want to highlight this to you. And I'll point out, like, even though the uh, reports of ransomware use didn't reach the peak of the initial disclosure, it's as wide as the initial disclosure. So it's still kind of stayed in the public conversation for uh, a pretty long time. The second thing I want to share with you is something that we're still a little early on, um, but we've been working on a, uh, this is a KEV prediction. So this is like a mixture of EPSS predicting something to be exploited. So we're trying to predict whether something will be added to the is a KEV. And what's really cool about this is, you know, we said the KEV is a short list. So if we can make predictions as to what will be on the KEV, we can give you a lead time on those due dates, and then we can give you that 
that meat that you're looking for that's not quite on the bone for, for the Kev currently. And I have some preliminary things that I think are really cool. Um, so the first thing is a vulnerability that we disclosed in July and predicted to be added to the Kev and a week later it was. That was really cool. The second thing is an interesting one. This is something we uh, saw disclosed in July. It was predicted to be added to the Kev. And even though it's a zero day, it still hasn't been added. And the reason is, what Jake said earlier, there's 100,000 vulns out there, more than that, that don't have CVE IDs. This thing doesn't. And if something doesn't have a CVE ID, it won't be on the Kev. It's a clerical requirement. So in spirit, this thing belongs on the Kev, but it's not there. And then there was another one that we, we saw disclosed in July that was predicted to be added and was. Uh, so there's some interesting outcomes of this, and, and again, just a couple examples, and we're still working on them. The last thing I want to go through is ransomware prediction. So just like getting ahead of social, getting ahead of social media exposure, getting ahead of the Sysikev, can we get ahead of ransomware? Obviously, ransomware can do a lot of reputational and financial damage to you, so if you can get ahead of it, that's really cool. And this is a really novel approach that I, I think is really interesting. We look at a bunch of factors on a vuln, kind of like that classification approach. You know, does it have an exploit? Is it remote? All that. There's a lot of different dimensions, a lot of classifications you can come up with. And what we do is we scrunch them all down and we plot them. Now, don't pay attention to what the axes mean on this plot. It's a very abstract concept. Uh, you, don't worry about it. Each one of these dots is a vulnerability, though, right? And when these dots are near each other, they're similar to each other. That's all you really have to know about this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark each dot with an X if it has an exploit, right? And you'll notice that that kind of popped in in that like upper right part of the screen, right? Now, I'm gonna color the vulns that are on the Kev red. You'll notice those are kind of on the lower left part of the screen, right? These are forming clusters and I'll color the black ones uh, for ransomware. And then these are all of it side by side, it's probably kinda hard to see, but you can see where these regions are starting to form. And what this means is, if everything here, this big green circle is a vuln, right? Obviously that's, that's our first premise. The stuff that tends to have exploits lives in this orange region. And the stuff that doesn't tend to have exploits, but when it does, they're really relevant, tend to live in this yellow region. And then right in the middle, that cross section, are the vulns that are used in ransomware. They tend to live there. So this is what I call the butterfly diagram. Um, and what we can do is when a new vulnerability gets disclosed, we can plot it here and see which neighborhood it lives in. So I'm gonna overlay this data on top of this again, and you'll notice, right, log4j is right at the base of that butterfly diagram. And there are also some other high profile vulnerabilities that live in that area too. Um, so this is a really, uh, I think, innovative and intuitive approach to being able to literally visualize a vulnerability instead of feeding it into some kind of um, opaque black box machine learning algorithm. All right, so uh, I think we all have our favorite things that we use. Obviously the innovative stuff is sort of mine, but I don't think there's anything wrong with liking one or, or another or, or even many. So I'm gonna pass it back to Jake, who's gonna go over maybe some of the more uh, real world applications of these uh, prioritization methods. Thank you, appreciate it. Are you still with us? All right, perfect. All right, so Hopefully we've taken you on a journey. You've learned a little bit here. Now let's try to uh, take this home with some, how can you, when you walk out of here, how can this really work for you? Um, is there anyone in the room that just thinks maybe it'll just naturally work out on its own? Maybe, maybe we should just go back to whatever happens, happens. I don't know, there are some days I feel like that might be the better move, but we'll move on. Um, so we covered a lot of stuff today, a lot of these you know, different uh, methods. And you may originally, or one came out, you go, oh, I like that one, I don't like that one. Or maybe you've been reading people that post nonstop on LinkedIn and you think you should like one versus another one. What we ended up doing here is we looked at all of June 2023. And so that you can see there were 1,907 vulnerabilities disclosed in June of 2023, okay? And then across the board, what we decided to do was, well, let's show you what the, the ratings would be for each one of those. Wouldn't it be neat to see it all on one screen, what that would look like? Okay, so uh, where we kept talking about the classification stuff, if you go to the far left, right, re uh, remote and exploit. So 479 of those, would you have fixed those? Now again, if you don't have the software in your organization, then you don't care. But of those, would you have told someone, 
hey, I think out of those 1,900, 479 of them, that's what we should fix, right? Um, now let's go over and let's talk about EPSS because EPSS has been getting a lot of love, okay? So if you would say, well, let's say there's a 75% chance it's gonna be exploited. There's just one of them. Would you just fix one? Would you like to go to your, your uh, manager and say, I just think we should fix one of these, that's it. Now, by the way, EPSS actually says if it's a 2% uh, prediction, 2%, you should fix anything over 2%. That's what EPSS says. So if you were in a conversation, let, let's take the, site, the nerd stuff out of it for a second. Hey, I think there's gonna be a 2% chance it's gonna rain today. You bring in your umbrella? You're not. But in the cyber world, we're like, 2%, hell yeah, fix it. So it's interesting, right? Now, I would also point out that in EPSS, um, they will say, in general, that they'll make four guesses on what you should fix, and as long as they get one out of four, they're doing amazing, okay? Now, I'm not saying that's bad, but when you think about it in terms of other predictions, like when you get cranky at the weather person, because they weren't spot on, here in the cyber world, we're, we're, we still got a ways to go, okay? Now, the other thing, um, the ransomware likelihood that Ben was talking about, you know, the key thing on that sort of theory is we have a lot of stuff where we're reactive. So the more that we're getting predictive, it is, it is better, right? So you hear a lot of, of people that will say, ah, this vuln is used by these ransomware operators, so you should fix it. Well, wouldn't it be great if we thought, hey, this looks like a vuln that could be used? So that whole innovative approach is really trying to get ahead of it. We don't know. We're not saying they will. There could be a universe in which they don't use it, but it looks like something that they would use. So like, shouldn't you go ahead and fix that ahead of time? So you can see on here, it's, it's a little tricky. So I ask you, how many would you fix? It's a tough question and it's one that we're still struggling with as an industry. Um, so what happens is you get people that say, this is annoying. Shouldn't there just be one standard to rule them all? Just give me one score. You guys are killing me. And this, this uh, cartoon that was shared with me is fabulous, right? Situation, there's 14 competing standards. So what are we gonna do? We need a universal standard, we need one. The new situation, now there's 15. And that's exactly how it is in the security world, right? Um, do we ever agree as cybersecurity professionals? You ask 10 different cybersecurity people what they should do, you get 10 different answers, you run into that. So look, here's back in uh, 2013, um, you know, even, even we were writing back and then saying, hey, this V2 thing's got problems, it needs to be fixed. There were conferences after conferences where people were saying, CVSS is horrible, you shouldn't use it, right? Uh, teams coming out in the, in the media, this is in 2019, don't use CVSS, it's not good to use. It was even described as broken. That's kind, of, that's kind of a nasty word to call it, broken, right? Wasn't just slightly inefficient or not very effective, it was broken. But it's not just that, right? You got SDI in here coming out and saying, yeah, you probably shouldn't rely on EPSS yet either. And at the time, right, a lot of the, the talks that were going on was CVS is bad, use EPSS. But while it was neat, at this particular time, right, is maybe you shouldn't rely fully on it. Um, here we are in 2022, uh, you know, even if CVS isn't, is, is good, the, the people scoring it maybe are scoring them wrong or don't understand the standard and the scoring guidelines. So you might have a, a perfect methodology, but then when you're applying the scores wrong, that doesn't help. Um, now 4.0 is here, and there's some hope that it's going to be better, but there's still a lot of people going, oh, I don't know, this is a hard problem. I'm not sure what we should do. And even our beloved CISA Kev, which so many people care about, which, which is great, I'm not, I'm not smack talking it, um, there's reports saying, yeah, this thing can't be trusted. So what is wrong with us, right? Like, will we ever agree on anything? I don't, I don't know if that answer is ever gonna be a yes. But what I do think we need to agree on is risk. We all just need to get over ourselves and agree on this, okay? So if there's a vulnerability and there's no ability to trigger it, there is no working exploit, reliable exploit, do you care about that vulnerability? Maybe, but not, not really, right? Maybe not at all, if I can't trigger it, like, 
Does it matter? So if we're thinking about a threat actor using an exploit to take advantage of a vulnerability of one of our assets, that's when we'll have those negative outcomes, a data breach, ransomware event, denial server, whatever it is, right? So we want to make sure we have to agree on this. And when we think about risk, the simplistic way to look at risk is, right, a threat, some kind of vulnerability, our asset risk is right there in the middle, right? So we tell people all the time, Try not to overcomplicate it. A risk score is asset value times threat likelihood times vulnerability exposure. We all need to agree on this. And that's why I think when you look at the standards that Ben was talking about, trying to be able to get in front of exploit to understand what is exploitable. As far back as, you know, 19, what did we say, 98, right? Vendors have been doing this for a long time, trying to say if we think it's exploitable and be triggered, this is a vuln you should pay attention to. All right, do we remember in the movie, flare was like a, a thing, right? It was like, don't talk to me about my flare, I don't wanna wear all those buttons. Maybe in the security space, flare isn't a bad thing. So Ben and I believe at the end of the day, instead of us fighting over what standard you're using, think about prioritization in a funnel, okay? So if we think about all vulnerabilities and we said to you, you need to, Take every one of them seriously. That's tough, right? Uh, 330,000 on this particular chart, 325,000 vulnerabilities, right? That is a lot. But if we want to narrow it down, how do we do that? Particularly if you're going into an organization or a business unit or, or whatever it may be, and the first time you're going in, there's just so many vaults, right? It, you're not on a, a good repeatable cycle yet. This is a great way to look at it and say, well, let's start here. Let's pick I don't know, CVSS V2, anything nine and over, funnel that down. So we, we drop that down immediately to 50,000 volts we care about. Then maybe let's pick EPSS 50%. And again, you can pick your range, whether it's 2% as they advise up to 50 and funnel it down. But in this particular case, with this funnel and those scoring, a ransomware critical at the end, you go from over 300,000 volts, you have to all treat the same, down to 134. So a great way to start. Now, if you don't like those, Switch it around, maybe go old school, remote and exploit, right? And you can see how that funnels it down for something you to do, okay? So don't just rely on one, rely on others. And in fact, once you get yourself going, a great way to operationalize this is to think there's some that like, you just don't pass go straight to jail, whatever it is, right? If it's ransomware potentially critical, it's on the Kev, you know, any of those sorts of things, those are ones that you're just gonna pull out and take care of. The other funnel, you can work them down to get to your, your target, okay? So, as we're wrapping up here, really, please, I think the, the, the takeaway is focus on what matters to your organization. Risk-based decisions are the way to go. And if you could do that, that, that would just be great, right? So with that, uh, we have a whole 30 seconds. So I don't think we have enough time for questions live. We'll stick around. There's a lot of great things. I will say there are a lot of people doing good analysis and work. Um, there's a lot of great organizations. Please go read their stuff. Um, and thank you for being here, and we appreciate your time. All right, my friend.